Yeah, welcome everybody to today's talk within the Design++ speaker series provided to you by the Design++ initiative of ETH Zurich. My name is Michael Kraus and I'm happy to be your host today. Uh, it is my special pleasure to welcome our guest and lecturer of today, Professor uh, Axel Kilian, uh, who is joining us uh, from MIT today. Before I uh, introduce you to our speaker and his talk, let me shortly provide some background information. The Design++ speaker series is a recurring event uh, where we provide invitations to upcoming events in due time uh, via our email list, the homepage, and the YouTube channel. You can find updates on the dates, speakers, and topics of the talks uh, of this semester at our homepage. And uh, if you want, you can also subscribe to our calendar to automatically import the invitations to those events. You're also warmly invited to have a look at our uh, previous presentations, uh, which are hosted on our YouTube channel. Uh, the link can be found here in the right uh, lower corner. At the moment, there is a number of uh, professors from architecture, civil engineering, and computer sciences from ETH involved in the Design++ initiative uh, for running the business. There is a three a team of three leading postdocs uh, responsible for operating uh, the business and the immersive design lab together with research and teaching activities. Uh, a growing number of scientists and chairs and professorships are associated to us. Uh, in case you are interested in the future of connecting AI, the machine learning and extended reality within the AEC industry, just reach out to us. We are happy to discuss uh, any further ideas or projects with you. Uh, having said all that, to the background of the Design++ and the speaker series, now let me introduce to you the speaker of today, uh, Professor Axel Kilian uh, from the MIT. Axel Kilian is uh, currently a visiting assistant professor at MIT Department of Architecture. Uh, he was uh, previously an assistant professor at Princeton University, also School of Architecture, and the Delft University of Technology and the postdoctoral associate at the Department of Architecture at MIT. He holds a PhD in design and computation and a Master of Science in Architectural Studies from the Department of Architecture at MIT. Uh, he came to the MIT as a German-American Fulbright Scholar uh, grantee after completing a professional degree in architecture at the University of Arts in Berlin. His work in architectural robotics has been exhibited at the Istanbul Design Biennale and the CUL Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism. His current research and teaching focus is on embodied computation, exploring the extension of architecture's material from into the behavioral through physical actuated and sensing prototypes of space. Please also have a look at his papers and especially his homepage, uh, which I also uh, linked here on the lower left corner. Uh, we will also provide this background information uh, on the uh, video of the YouTube homepage. And uh, yeah, now with uh, no further ado from my side, I would hand over to you, Axel. Uh, the stage is, is yours. Thank you, Michael. Right, great. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I'd like to um, take the chance to speak about uh, my work in embodied computation in this framework. And as a sort of brief precursor, uh, I'd like to start with a, a short definition, um, which is always tricky because obviously it's not holistic and all encompassing, but as a sort of uh, primer, the way I understand this design is basically the organization of matter such that the design intent is captured and embodied in its form. So that's probably a, yeah, for a long time has been an approach to kind of capture design intent and it's powerful and it's um, persistent and it's robust. Um, what I'd like to argue in this sort of line of design plus plus, for me, design plus plus could be understood um, as the extension of material form into the behavioral through embodied computation. So arguing that ultimately the extension of design should go beyond, let's say, the assistance, the assisting of the design proce process through other means into the actual build form and the existence of the structure. This has 
um, in terms of the notion of embodied computation has precedence in our own self and biology. Like computation always has a location, a physical sort of place where it's happening. So in the somatosensitory and motor cortex in our brains, this is interestingly uh, detectable in this uh, somewhat grotesque distortion of the density of um, sensory uh, feedback and the brain region uh, that it's taken up uh, and is basically a kind of unrolling of our uh, mostly external sensory cortex reflecting yeah, the sort of bias or the weighting of uh, sens senses uh, on our body. So fingers, face, etc. cetera, are vastly um, more detailed or higher resolution than other parts of the body. And also coming back later, interesting, the internal uh, senses of the internal body are almost non-existent in comparison. So there's also uh, like such a mapping would be interesting to do for all machines and things that we built, but mostly it's going to be very sparse because sensing is still um, vastly sort of outnumbered number, by the uh, just sheer physical presence and size of uh, things we as humans built. Um, but there's still emerging trends in mechanical engineering over the past decades where for a long time mechanical engineering had been dominated by analog computing, meaning the mechanical complexity of control systems, such as the helicopter rotor head on the left um, exhibits a pretty drastic or a pretty extreme form of mechanical complexity for control to ultimately um, shuffle air in the right direction, the right angle, uh, governed by a control stick through mechanical linkages and cams and shafts and, uh, and other control mechanisms. But ultimately it's a mechanical system where computation is ultimately through the state of, of matter propagated through the system. In terms of the emergence of drones and um, the shift from mechanical complexity to algorithmic complexity, it's fascinating that uh, that sort of uh, led to the simplification of the mechanical control mechanisms. So basically complexity is now in the algorithm, no longer in the mechanics. And in machine learning, this has accelerated further where now we're basically seeing a closed a box uh, complexity of machine learning algorithms that are for the most part, not fully or well understood, um, but also this interesting aspect of shared, shared learning across uh, different physical bodies. Uh, so basically one experience can be shared and remapped on, onto another body um, through these sort of devices. So further abstractions um, of the sort of uh, connection between, I guess, physical and computational construct, but also an extension of uh, beyond the self, um, which biology has uh, as a limitation. This has much earlier precedence in its um, more simple forms in, let's say, material computation, like such uh, as in ship curves, where basically material computes in terms of curvature, and one can handle it as a sort of physical um, curvature continuity artifact, which uh, I, in my own work many years ago, used um, as a last step for fabrication by trying to escape the planarity uh, kind of constrained of laser cut uh, fabricated parts by using ultimately the last step of a spring loaded um, curving, uh, constrained curving of the parts through assembly. So ultimately seeing assembly as a fabrication step for achieving form rather than just a sort of puzzling of fixed pieces. Um, and also in the exploration of um, basically extending uh, geometry from its descriptive geometry understanding through modeling towards one of discoveries. So in 2003, developed this hanging chain modeler uh, for a seminar I co-taught with John Oxendorf and Eric Marty Demain, um, where basically, uh, and Barbara Cutler, where the idea was, could we sort of capture form finding processes, physical ones and digital form uh, in an intuitive design interface developed in processing using Simon Greenwald's implementation of a particle spring library. So this is very, very well known and completely mainstream now through tools like Kangaroo and Grasshopper, et cetera, but at the time it was not. Um, and it's sort of reshaped uh, my understanding of uh, how to approach design. So it's really much more about confining constraints and geometric 
form is a discovery process that fulfills, fulfills these constraints. So defining the topology and the geometric length of parts and then submitting in this case through artificial gravity uh, in a simulation results in a geometric form. Uh, so design is here much more a process of design uh, of, of discovery um, rather than a uh, kind of problem solving approach. Uh, so the question is ultimately, of course, how to make this more general. So I did another implementation at the time using a games engine uh, and pushing towards steering of design, which is the next extension, um, trying to break out of this catenary formal language and introducing moment limited uh, actuators in each of the joints, which then allows for um, bending resistant members to be introduced into the catenary, uh, thereby allowing for flat sections uh, with the trade-off of um, basically more material uh, to take those loads, but ultimately trying to move towards a more universal steering of design system where basically intents come together and are um, resolved within a computational systems to arrive at a uh, design uh, sort of state um, that would be ideally a novel answer to an unknown answer rather than the confirmation of uh, a priori belief. So going back into the physical, uh, I started working with uh, actuation, um, simulation sort of linked, so in this case, the curved crease, uh, for the structure with pneumatic um, to see how through the programming form, I can get a um, structural response. Um, and also experimented for a long time with um, completely doing it programming, uh, in the sense of uh, 3D printing, also with the actuators integrated, etc. So ultimately, can I just basically get all the behavior through a single process? Um, and then moving on towards uh, using the, at that time, uh, newly acquired, uh, donated robotic arm in Princeton University, uh, together with Ryan Jones, experimenting with whether we could uh, sort of circumvent the top-down placement that the 3D printer does, which basically deadens any material response and instead use more dynamic processes. So we attached a uh, veil of uh, viscous liquid and used different patterns, geometric patterns of swigging, and filmed the resultant um, liquid, which was uh, chaotic at first, but when strobing it at a certain frequency, um, we discovered that there's stable liquid forms. So, of course, that liquid form is very difficult to use. Maybe it could work as a liquid lens in the sense of basically just shaping light at the moment when it occurs. Um, but we wanted to also get more stable um, outcomes from that. So, we experimented with injecting in 2014 as part of the Rob Arch. Uh, workshop injecting uh, basically using let's say the, the liquid and the pressure of uh, injected liquid and the carrier liquid um, to do uh, sort of uh, zero I mean neutral buoyancy printing first using hand soaps on the left and then hydrogel baths on the right. The sort of fluid dynamics of the liquid uh, being injected uh, together with the insertion um, to allow for some open ended yeah, kind of material um, in the design process. So, this resulted in these types of uh, tests. Uh, it's still very messy and uh, precise, but uh, intentionally to leave some open endedness to the kind of materialization process rather than a kind of blind. Uh, execution of uh, geometric intent. So again, trying to hand over or retain some agency of the material process for this sort of final uh, process, as opposed to treating it as a kind of um, uh, blind execution like a 3D printer would. Uh, so we went further and took this uh, to architectural scale in the WAVE fanfare project, together with uh, composer Jeff Snyder of the Laptop Orchestra at Princeton University and uh, again, Ryan uh, Luke Jones and lighting designer, Jane Cox. Um, the challenge there was to basically uh, create an installation for the opening of the uh, Lewis Center of the Arts at Princeton University by Stephen Hall Architects. Um, that was um, an interesting 
uh, set up steam hall, architects often use uh, pools with water and skylights uh, to connect different floor levels and plazas, and as in this case as well. But the problem was that in our perception, we were not aware really of being underwater under the lobby. So we decided to work with the robotic architectural interventions, say, to draw attention to that and also connect the upper plaza uh, to the uh, concert that was happening below, in a sense, augmenting this architecture for the opening and create awareness of these connections. So I developed a robotic pendulum, very simple counter swinging kind of actuated um, pendulum through a series of prototypes increasing scale um, um, that basically allowed these two um, 40 pound LED um, themes to be suspended over uh, this pool here uh, that then basically um, formed the skylight of this uh, of the concert and using the actual water as a liquid lens, uh, so the caustics of this water distortion um, through a um, pneumatically actuated piston um, that would allow us um, to basically pulse the um, <clears throat> uh, light beam that went through the, um, through the skylight. So this is always not decoding the first time it's being played. So let's try that again. Um, so the rhythm of the uh, light beam basically gives the rhythm of the uh, performance underneath um, and basically connects the building through the skylight, through the stage below. And then the, um, um, uh, the water table is being actuated by the uh, pneumatic pistons, uh, creating a standing wave uh, over the skylight, which uh, refracts the water, uh, the light going through the water. Unfortunately, at this point, um, PowerPoint has crashed, I believe. Let's try again. And this was the um, uh, experience when the stage of the musician is playing a uh, uh, piece below, um, kind of keeping track of the rhythm of the light uh, connected to the water table above to the stage to the reflective um, floor. Um, so this type of kinetic intervention as an extension uh, of design started much earlier in 2005. I was getting frustrated with the design concept car media lab at the Mitchell's group in terms of uh, approaching car design purely as a formal sort of conceptual sort of approach and explored um, sort of robotic um, versions by basically sketching skeletons and foam core and actuating it through, uh, in this case, a series of um, uh, six servos that allowed for basically form to shift through to um, sort of behavioral expression, beginning of kind of um, motion as an expression form, extension of form, um, which started a longer sort of engagement with this type of actuated structures. So at first, we developed this approach further. I made an aluminum prototype in the left with uh, eight degrees of freedom. Uh, and we pushed for General Motors to construct a prototype of this structure, which they refused because uh, uh, it didn't match their expectations of the car should look like, uh, surprisingly. So we went to, uh, ahead and built a prototype ourselves, which was the first instance of what I refer to as a selective prototype on the right which basically a selective prototype in my definition is a prototype that is a testable entity for human scale uh, inhabitant um, that um, basically selects the key kind of subsets of the overall sort of concept uh, in a more affordable and simpler um, uh, configuration in this case, instead of four robotic wheels, one robotic wheel, instead of a full frame body, just a helper wheel kind of structure and one seat instead of two. Um, but ultimately, kind of the equivalent of a sort of lab experiment in architectural or, in this case, um, automotive design, which became also um, a constant theme in my research and uh, teaching, 
of how to sort of create selective prototypes of full scale uh, yet testable structures. Uh, we then uh, won the uh, what, who, what, when um, competition by Yang Ho Chang, the incoming head of the architecture department at the time, to build a mini skyscraper at MIT. Um, so we were the team of Philip Locke, uh, myself, uh, Peter Schmidt, and John Snavely, uh, using what we've learned from the uh, robotic car construction to make this fiberglass um, 40 something uh, foot structure with eight um, degrees of freedom. Um, using festo pneumatic actuators to make this active, uh, uh, sort of um, actively controlled uh, structure that rather than being stiff and overdimensioned for the worst case, uh, could basically potentially lean into or lean away from uh, wind gusts and other things, and also had a uh, playful sort of side for it. Uh, so we ultimately uh, did not succeed in programming this structure. We could only hand um, operate it with eight degrees of freedom. It's quite tricky, which also led to the next um, research project of making a fully programmed, controlled kind of structure. Uh, this shows the eight degrees of freedom and how they impact the tower movement. Um, and the sort of final result at the time, uh, showing a human operator on the right, controlling the tower uh, in different positions. So I took the project on uh, and over to Princeton University uh, and rebuilt uh, a desktop scale uh, prototype uh, then called the Bow Tower, where I shifted then what we had, uh, took on what we had in an initial prototype for the tower at MIT, which was a more uh, active bending core and adjusted it um, to uh, sort of fuse the two concepts, uh, shifting what was before, before a rigid um, sort of uh, knee joint one level up and uh, turn it into a uh, active bend fiberglass rod, in this case, uh, children's bows, and use custom uh, pneumatic actuators. We then maybe focus on the programmability. So here the physical structure in its form gets quite drastically extended through the ability to um, uh, have coordinated actuation. So you can make it sort of dance or exhibit different uh, characters and also have uh, rudimentary action. Um, up to the tower and pushing it over an accelerometer off of the sun system and then push it back. Um, this quickly um, opened up questions of what is the relationship between the physical structure uh, and its uh, simulations. And the robotics uh, approach is to have a, a digital simulation of the other factors, the physical, and uh, in many cases, thousands and thousands of test runs and learning runs and simulated structure, and then map that uh, is very powerful. Uh, but it also has some issues, especially for larger, more complex structures, which I would view architectural uh, robot robots at building scale being such things that last a long time, that simulation and physical reality can diverge. Right? If something breaks, if something is altered, um, the simulation may not match anymore with the physical structure. Of course, one could update it. But what I was getting interested here is whether one would it would whether it would not be possible to invert um, uh, this dependency in the physical structure itself as the um, kind of simulation soul simulation. So in this case, I'm using the uh, tower as the um, um, as in a sense a uh, function which I send six um, uh, values to in terms of the pressure settings for the six uh, actuator. And then the return value of this physical function is the angle of the power. So I have no other knowledge of the structure. So I have no simulation or no skeletal simulation or kinetic uh, structure, but solely operate uh, through this interface of sending um, pressures and getting a return value. And so I then use the simplex search function in a very primitive way to um, find an optimum to basically slowly build up, ultimately like 
could call the muscle memory of the structure. Right? So which settings result in which uh, angles uh, over time. And here you see the two uh, paths of uh, such a search process, one's with a flat base and the other color with a angled base. Right? So ultimately arguing that as um, such structures become more complex and more open-ended and also more involve more uh, human interaction, maybe it's advantageous to kind of depart from the established simulation physical paradigm and use the structures themselves to learn um, about how they impact the world and how they respond to the physical world. So this involves uh, also sensing, uh, which opens up another dilemma, um, which the dominant sensory orientation in also in robotics is one of objects, intelligent objects, having outward facing sensors to the world, such in this example of an autonomous car sensor suite. So there's uh, tens of sensors facing outwards, but as we know from many of the recent autonomous driving accidents and failures, there's still like a much smaller number of sensors on the inside, mostly a steering wheel kind of touch or maybe some occupant monitoring uh, eye, eye attention monitoring sensors and probably some seat pressure for airbag release kind of, but that's pretty much it. So the social space, which is in a sense a very complex uh, one in, in the interior of the car is uh, similarly uh, sort of a blind spot um, as our um, intestines are in our own body where the um, sensory map basically has a vast amount of area in the brain mapped on the outside, but not on the inside. So we're much less aware of what's going on in our interiors, both robots and selves, than uh, from the outside, which makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint, because once uh, a living being eats another living being, there's not much um, selective sort of benefit on communicating with the interior unless you're Jonah and the whale. Um, so this is something that needs to change um, if we want to move into what I'm um, uh, pushing forward is architectural robotics, meaning architecture as robots that are inhabited by people. So natural systems give some precedence there, but if we treat robots, uh, if we treat architecture as uh, entities as opposed to collectives, um, then the closest we still can find in nature is more like ecosystems, uh, which are collections of species, but not so much, let's say, living entities that house other living entities and have a, some conscious interaction. Um, so as I usually do, I'm trying to uh, construct uh, selective prototypes to as provocations to make myself and others that see them um, think about this uh, hunch I have uh, and maybe gain some insights, not to improve anything or to um, optimize anything, but more like to yeah, push a certain shift of thinking or, um, or push myself also to a, a next sort of uh, stage of uh, dealing with this question. So in this case, it was the flexing room uh, here shown at the Sol Binale in a, only in its half height uh, installation, since the space didn't quite fit by a few inches um, second level. But ultimately now uh, the shift from a robot, from robots as I've shown all the ones before as objects uh, towards a robot that has an interior that's occupiable. Um, uh, so taking on basically this uh, John and the whale kind of um, dilemma and saying like, okay, we have to create a sensory space and interior um, and also develop a ultimately body language of the structure and to communicate um, with its inhabitants to overcome this existing engineering paradigm, which is ultimately still the dominant one now right on the left from the 1950s. So if we want to in, uh, operate with our engineered artifacts like a car, we have to strap ourselves in. So we are exactly in the intended pose for the um, designed crash uh, response, right? so in any other position we may die, um, or the sort of next stage of robotic human interaction, sort of exoskeletons where you basically become an extension, uh, an, an augmented version of yourself for wearing the robot and there's some sensing in terms of actions, interactions as in this exoskeleton uh, example. Uh, and then ultimately what I'm claiming or trying to provoke 
a sort of more free agency of inhabiting a robot uh, and choosing uh, where you are, how you are, when you come, and how you go, and interact within a space-defining robot that isn't is no longer a, an object. Um, and then in this example, again a very simplistic um, first attempt at, at sort of a lifetime sort of learning, where the structure strikes poses, random poses over time, and keeps a memory tab of how many people were in each pose to get sort of a very primitive um, popularity curve for different poses to ultimately uh, create, let's say, a, a sort of um, memory log of all the interactions and their responses over time uh, to ideally learn over time how its body impacts uh, its inhabitants um, using, uh, again, this language of actuated active bending fiberglass bows and custom pneumatic actuators and control valves, valves uh, all built uh, from scratch for the structure, 36 of those. And ultimately, the hope was in these experiments that some um, primitive architectural gestures would evolve. So for instance, could this beam by arcing um, become a de facto door? So by inviting people or people more likely stepping through an arcing uh, segment than through a uh, sloping down segment. Um, so could there be subtle, uh, over longer time, subtle ar architectural gestures evolve that basically lead to this kind of um, uh, body language of the structure, learning slowly, step by step, how um, each of those actions influences um, in, in terms of using the uh, humans now as the sort of return function. Right? Before in the tower, it was simple angle sensors, but now using social construct of people inhabiting the space as the return function. So this experiment uh, in that sense failed because I uh, only was able to run it for hours at a time. And um, my machine learning capabilities were not sufficient to deploy that um, in a more sophisticated manner beyond just like popularity kind of ranking over time of postures. So uh, this is mostly a limitation of my own work so far, but uh, still it was um, provocative as a sort of starting point to kind of let go of uh, the sort of design form or animation um, of form um, as a way to act less with the structure and instead uh, uh, let it uh, is to run its course over time and uh, observe uh, itself to uh, interact with um, uh, the people. So spending many hours within it, just kind of observing what is taking place on uh, face, and at the same time, I can actually count in the number of uh, yeah, amount of time spent in each uh, offer, whether somebody was doing it or not, uh, spending the amount of time. So these are just some uh, glances at this um, longer test form. Um, this is a data gatherer. Axel, can I say something really quickly? Yeah. Um, when the video sound is on, it's very difficult to hear and understand you. Sure. So yeah, that was thanks. also the last video. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I will um, summarize what I just said. Also, the um, so the last uh, videos um, were showing like a longer term uh, test runs, um, basically gathering and uh, gathering experience and just getting a feel for what it is feel like to inhabit such a structure and how hectic or how slow it has to be, which is another big challenge in architectural robotics that our interactive uh, sort of paradigm is mostly shaped by uh, split second type of interactions with uh, digital screen based um, devices where we basically constantly expect an, a response, action response, whereas architecture is operating in the time scale of um, sort of hours, days, weeks, and years, and decades. So this is yeah, a different challenge in terms of um, developing this type of body language. And with the final sort of statement to summarize, so I'm gonna read this, when architecture becomes robotic, its autonomy means that the design process must, must extend beyond the schematics and the design development and construction and into the lifespan of the building. 
uh, becoming a learning process in the context of its environment. Design is therefore not to be understood as an isolated process at the beginning of a sequence that entails fabrication and habitation, but rather as to be treated as one continuous process, linking the design process with the process of use. The term embodied computation stands for the expansion of computation as an abstract predominantly computational process into a hybrid physical computational construct. Computation extends beyond the limitation of describing the object and reaches into the realm of the lived in architecture, thus enabling autonomous architectural robotics. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to discussion or any questions. Thank you, Axel, for this interesting talk and the discussion. Your time and efforts are very much appreciated. As I said before, I will upload the information of this talk together with the video uh, on our YouTube channel. Yeah, eventually I want to highlight our next and already last talk of this semester on the topic of creativity in computational structural design, delivered by Dr. Ole Woodrock in about two weeks on the 16th of December at 4 p.m. So thank you again for joining today. Stay safe and see you next time.